Hello, Bravo lovers, and welcome to a brand new episode of Bravo Tea with Jared B. Of course, I am your host, Jared B., and I have a special episode for you today because I have interviewed Gabriella Bettergon from season three of Below Deck Sailing Yacht. That's correct, aka Gabby. She was on Bravo Tea with Jared B. We talked about life after Below Deck and how she has had to work so hard to rebuild her life after being on the show and how that has impacted her ability to get jobs on other yachts. She talks about what life was like uh, filming Below Deck Sailing Yacht, what her rapport was like with production, and she also mentioned it all when it comes to this reality reckoning and the potential litigation against NBC. Universal and Bravo. She was open, she was honest, she was vulnerable, and I think she gave a full spectrum of what it's like to be a reality star on one of these shows. Let's give it up for Gabriella Beragon. want to thank you so much for coming on Bravo Tea with Jared B. I'm so happy to have you here today. How have you been doing? I'm good. It's so nice to meet you. Thank you for inviting me on. Of course. Um, I'm good. I'm just chilling. I see. I follow you on Instagram now. So are you, are you still working on boats? Are you still mm-hmm. a yachty? Okay. Yeah, That's I am. Awesome. Um, we filmed the show two years ago, right? 2021. And um, I've never stopped working on boats uh, since I left the show. So I'm currently working um, with the fleet of yachts here in San Diego. So I'm like the chief stew, I cook, I do deck work and I like manage, I manage like three yachts. Um, Yeah, so. Oh oh my gosh, a true (laughs) renaissance woman. (laughs) <laughs> doing it all <laughs> I, I mean it's, the the west coast isn't a huge yachting hub yeah so there's not a lot of yacht crew out here so when there's boats in town um there, it's just me so <laughs> so um i get a lot of work because um the industry is not oversaturated out here like it is in florida yeah okay yeah. so, so you you're a high commodity in San Diego. Oh, yeah. Not to <laughs> do, brag. Do you feel like your experience on Below Deck prepared you to do all that you are doing now? Um, no. No? <laughs> I, think that, I think that I was too experienced for Below Deck. Okay. Um, because yachting... Although it's it's a pretty close representation of how the industry can be, it's not really like that at all. So um, I think that my skills that I already had before I went on the show um, might have led me to take myself and the job a little bit too seriously, which contributed to all of my frustration. And um, so I, I couldn't say that the show has helped me in any way when it comes to my yachting career. If anything, it's hindered me. <laughs> I mean, do do you think there's hesitation to hire you because you were on Below Deck? Yes. Oh, there is wow. no. I've I've been um, through interviews where I get to the final round and they're really like excited, and then they do a quick Google search and they call me back and they're like, "Wait, were you on the show?" Even if they haven't seen it, they're like, "Oh, yeah." Uh-huh. Um, the owners don't like to hire people that were on the show. It's happened to me mm-hmm. two separate times. Wow. <laughs> on like really big boats and re- like the programs that I want to work with that I'm qualified for. Um, just the simple fact that I was on the show has gotten in the way of many opportunities. I mean, I guess it's, you know, the reputation of anyone that might be on that show being, you know, uh, unprofessional, difficult to work with you know, et cetera, et cetera. Oh, that's or inexperienced or, or inexperienced. inexperienced or reckless. And for the most part, especially what we've seen in the last few seasons, they they really do hire people 
that don't know what they're doing that um might even like it might even be dangerous having these people on the boats that size um that just want to get famous yeah. and don't really care about yachting so um i can see why that is the perception of people that still work on yachts that happen to have been on the show i worked but i've worked for people that don't care at all they're like whatever yeah. it's TV. like whatever not a big deal you know but then i've worked on boats where they knew and hired me anyways and then I felt like I was constantly trying to prove to them that I wasn't the person they saw on the show, which was an added pressure. Um, or, you know, I don't talk about the show a lot um, in my professional life. I don't advertise that I was on it. I don't talk about it unless someone recognizes me. And there's been times where, you know, captains would be like, oh yeah, I know you were on the show, but it's okay. But then if we were out, in public they'd be like they would always bring it up if i met a new person mm. like she was on below deck and like oh, or no. make fun of me or or whatever it was really annoying and i'm just like it's it's been hard to navigate the industry after being on the show what's that 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 one season of your life that what is it three months of filming it's <laughs> yeah six weeks six, it's gonna so follow six weeks me of it's gonna follow me for the rest of my life um i knew what i was getting into um, I just didn't know how my experience would be and how it would negative for me. I always think I'm winning. I'm delusional. So I was like, whatever happens, I'm still going to come out on top. Doesn't matter. So I had that, you know, mentality and I was yeah. humbled pretty quickly <laughs> where I'm like, oh, okay. Like I can't force people to understand me or see me the way I want them to see me if they have their mind made up about who you are because you did a reality show one time in your life, mm -hmm. then that's it. And it's really hard to come back from that. <laughs> well, that's the thing. And that's the thing I love doing about this show because like I've been watching, you know, Bravo for years, probably since I was in like middle school, eighth grade, and now I'm 31. And so you have these preconceived notions of who you think these people are when you watch them on television and like I made it my goal to make sure that when I invited people on that we get to see another aspect of who a person is because you know you guys are not in control of editing and how a storyline is played out on the show yeah. you know you basically show up you're filmed for all these hours and you have no say in how people see you yeah and yeah. and I mean, is, do you feel like during your time on the show, we, the viewers, got to see an accurate portrayal of who you are as a person? I think that you guys got to see um, a side of me, a side of me that was represented well. Um, how hard I work, how well I got along with the guests, um, how frustrated I was, those things were all really true. Yeah, so yes, um, you guys didn't see all my meltdowns, all of my blackout bad moments, except probably the last episode I was on in the villa where it was like clear that I was absolutely gone. But like, I would say overall, yeah, I think that the audience got to see an accurate representation of who I am and like, how I wanted to be perceived, you know, like I take my job seriously. I'm yeah. a hustler, like, you know, yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, one thing I respect is that, you know, you, you didn't stay the full charter season. You know, there was a certain point that you went to Captain Glenn um, and said, you know what? I don't believe that this is the right environment for me to be in. I don't think that my presence is contributing to the camaraderie among the, you know, the crew members. And you basically dismissed yourself. <laughs> um, and, but like, that's to be, you know, a lot of people lean in and just like, you know, F it, you know, I might not be having a good time. I might be going through some drama, but I'm going to stay. But you decided to protect yourself and your yeah. spirit and you know your reputation um and like what was 
like the actual breaking point when you're like, okay, it's time for me to say goodbye? Well, this is the thing. Um, I was left in the dark about a lot of things. Um, a lot of the things that were happening behind the scenes, um, like Ashley's campaign against me, I didn't see until the show aired and no one was forthcoming with me or real to tell me what was going on. Kelsey was a little nicer to me, like when I would come to her for like, what's going on? Like, why does everybody hate me? What's going on? And she, Kelsey was not scared of me. She was like, you get, you get mean when you're drunk or if you have a bone to, pe bone to pick, it comes out when you're drinking and it's like, and you know, it's antagonizing or whatever. You're just a little bit mean when you're drunk. How about just next time, like we go out, you just don't drink. That was her word of advice, but no one went into details about what of all of our beef was about. Um, and I didn't know that Ashley was getting in everyone's ear um, and talking shit about me to whoever was, would listen. And when I, the breaking point was when I felt they, them all siding with her um, believing anything she said because there were comments made to me that wasn't shown um that to me were out of left field you know like what like why would you have to why would you say that like no clue what you're talking about so I was I was ostracized from the group and when I saw that it wasn't getting better um I felt like there was no coming back like all the damage had been done I was there for four weeks filming mm -hmm. is six weeks that's that's pretty much a lot a month yeah. <laughs> it was almost a month pretty much um i felt like two weeks is not enough time for me to come back and maybe it could have been if you know on our nights out i cut out the booze completely but there was already such a disconnect and the team had their own group it was it was you know six against one and it was a very lonely place to be our job is super stressful and although I was connecting with the, I was closer to all of our charter guests than I was to my crew, the people that I sleep mm -hmm. with and work with 24 seven. Um, I'm not going to get too much into production, but there was a lot of issues with production as well when it came to me yeah. um, in, in terms of not being supported, not being advocated for, um, manipulated, gaslighted. So I had it on both sides and I, felt like I was going crazy and the alcohol didn't make it better <laughs> for sure. Um, but that was the way that I decided to cope. It was the easiest option. We couldn't leave the boat. We couldn't go on a run. We couldn't, if I put on my headphones and went to the sun deck to like dance for a little bit or call a family member, they would be like, Hey, get off the phone. Like take your earphones out, go connect with the crew. Like you can't, you can't decompress. It's almost like you're being put in a pressure cooker mm -hmm. and, yeah. you know, there's no escape. <laughs> no, there's no escape. And, it, you know, it's almost like that show Big Brother where yeah. they're in a house. They can't Absolutely. speak to anyone but the people in their house. They have no yeah. outside resources. And that's, you know, people start going a little crazy right. and start and, acting out. You know, when you're with people that constantly invalidate your reality and your feelings, it, it's called crazy making. They mm -hmm. make you crazy. And when you react, they focus on your reaction instead of what they did or said to get you to that place. So I was constantly being villainized, um, ganged up on. There was just no support. And I knew I was going to end up, if I didn't snap on the Villa Day, like that was it. Like, it, like the Villa Day. And I don't even think I snapped. I think I was very calm. But um, I felt like I would be fired and then that would really, because at this point I felt like everyone was looking for a reason, uh, to make me look bad. Yeah. So I was going to be on eggshells the rest of the season. I couldn't make any mistakes. All eyes were on me. And I felt like, you know, one day I'm going to forget, you know, to put a fork on the table and that they're going to be like, you know what, you got to go. Like, you know, I just yeah. I felt it, whether or not that's true. That's what it felt like. And so I felt like it was a better option to put my mental health first because I was, I was not okay. I was in duress for real. I was, um, nowhere to go, no one to turn to, no one to talk to. And I couldn't handle it on my own. And I was like, I need to get away from these toxic ass people because they're making me toxic. 
and it's now it's affecting my job because I'm losing my confidence. Yeah. Um, and I didn't want to go out like that. I was like, you know what? I love me more. I deserve better than this. So I got to go. Yeah. You know? And oh I do God. have a lot of pride and my ego was bruised, but at the same time, it's like, I, you have to like, like I had to like show, show up for myself because no one else was, Yeah. you know? So I was the right, definitely the right decision. You know, so often, um, cause you know, we, we are starting to see a lot of former, um, cast members of these shows speak mm -hmm. up about their experiences. And one thing I see a lot of viewers say, fans of the show is like, you know, you signed up for this. Um, why are you complaining now? Um, yeah. What do you say to some of those people that, you know, you get what you sign up for? Okay, well, this is the thing that people don't understand about the entertainment industry, whether it's reality TV or not. It's a job. So Below Deck is insane because it's like one of the highest rated shows on the network yep. with the lowest pay. And you're actually doing another job. You're doing two jobs, the yachting job and the TV job, right? Because on our downtime, they have us in hair and makeup and doing our interviews that can last four, six, eight hours. And we're not being paid for that. So for the people that say you signed up for this, you know what you're getting into. I mean, that doesn't mean that you deserve d abuse from any employer. So if someone's working co in corporate and they have a workplace bully, they're being sexually harassed and they're complaining or venting to their friends and they're like, hey, I need, I need to get a lawyer, I need to seek justice or I'm going to HR. Are you gonna say to them, well, you know what you were getting into you know, it's a male dominated yeah. industry that you chose. So basically you deserve it. So if people could look at filming a reality TV show, like a job that just so happens to be in the entertainment industry, maybe they could understand that better yeah. and change their perspective a little bit, because at the end of the day, it's a job. Filming a reality TV show is a full time job and it's scarier because like you said in the beginning of the podcast is that you don't have any control over how you're portrayed because there's a story every person needs a character type a character arc mm -hmm. and they need to find you know snippets and sound bites and scenes that make that character arc and it's all it's out of your hands it's very stressful it can be very traumatizing it could also be very fun and very rewarding for those that um you know, our fan favorites and get to do other shows and get to all these, you know, endorsements and this and that. So um, I think that's a very insensitive way to look at people that are now coming forward, talking about the, you know, unfair treatment they received on whatever shows they were doing. And, you know, labor laws still apply. Mm -hmm. That is okay. true. So, <laughs> <laughs> what are y'all talking about? There are still labor laws, California labor laws. And there's a lot of things that any job they cannot do to you with the, you know, whether it's down, like no breaks, shoving alcohol down your throats, not giving you lunch. Like all these things are illegal. People it doesn't matter if it's reality show or not. It's illegal. Um, speaking of, you know, being, uh, given a lot of alcohol, um, of course there was, on August 24th, Rolling Stone broke a story uh, where uh, there was a legal letter sent to NBC Universal, Bravo, E! News, um, accusing them of covering up sexual assault, um, racism, uh, boozing cast members up and not providing them with food. Um, what went through your mind when you saw that story broke because it was everywhere i had two feelings one was no one's gonna believe the woman that came forward just like no one's gonna believe rachel from vanderpump rules just like no one believes bethany because the narrative around 
reality stars that speak up after the fact is that, oh, you're just bitter because it didn't work out for you. And that's how people invalidate your experience. Oh, you're just jealous because you're not famous. Oh, you're just jealous because your 15 minutes of fame is over and that's why you're complaining. So that was my first thought because I was like, am I gonna say something about what happened to me? And then my second feeling was of validation um, in, a, in a sense where like, you know, people that support me and after therapy and after, you know, I have a support system and, and you know, supporters of mine, like fans, people that watch the show that DM me and they say, we see you. And people that have always said, the truth is gonna come out eventually, like you just sit back and wait. I felt like vindicated, like in that moment, like, oh, like, and then I thought about this, the blind item that came out about my season, about how it was edited out of the show, how there was microaggressions and da da da, da and how I was like, that blind item was true. <laughs> and like everything that that blind item said was true, but I've, I was always scared to sit, to just come out and say that and, and, the fact that this woman went to Rolling Stone and just said what she said, I was like, I'm glad it, I didn't have to be the martyr because I swear to God, my whole life, I have always been the martyr and it always blows up in my face. It always, I never come out on top. And like, I just didn't have the emotional um, energy to carry that torch I, because I'm not, I wasn't, I'm not still in the best place. And I mm. knew that I couldn't handle any backlash I couldn't fight with the trolls on the internet. I didn't have it in me, you know, because I'm finally coming out the other side a year and a half later. So it, w I felt like it was like, okay, like I'm finally get gonna get to speak to the people I need to speak to, you know, and and something's gonna be done. But it, it didn't have to be carried by me. And I felt like no one would believe me anyways. No one would listen to me anyways, because I'm always going to be written off like, oh, you're just mad because you didn't get invited back to the show, or you're just mad because of this, that, and the other thing, or you're just jealous or whatever. So I believe the article. Um, I, I, people don't understand that it's not Bravo that produces Below Deck. Each Below Deck franchise has a different production company. So mm -hmm. the responsible the responsibility is on that production company for that franchise. So for Below Deck Down Under, where Nadine is the executive producer and she broke the fourth wall and bravo to her, but she works with Shed Media, I believe. And my production company was 51 Minds. So personally, I think 51 Minds is responsible and NBC Universal because NBC Universal owns Bravo. And everything, when they say, oh, we have to run this by the network, we have to run this by the network, they're talking about NBC, they're not talking about Bravo. So I don't even think Andy watches the show. So like, <laughs> you know, like Andy produces The Real Housewives. So yeah. in that situation, it would be directly like him because he's the executive yes. producer. You know what I mean? So I've had a couple of meetings with NBC Universal prior to this big, you know, Pandora's box being opened. And, you know, I've spoken to, you know, the top people at NBC and had meetings with them about some of the stuff that happened during my season, but you know, nothing's come out of it. And some of, some of the time they're like, we had no idea that happened. Mm. Like because the production company and the executive producers can choose to leave NBC in the dark as long as they don't get caught. So it's very complicated. It's a very tough, to try to lead this crusade like Bethany Frankel is doing, I'm just like, whoa, like, how is this gonna work unless everyone comes together? I'm thinking about Simone from like season like three or four. I'm thinking about- of o From OG yeah. Below Deck? Yes. yes. Yeah. I'm thinking about Linz, uh, Reina. I'm mm -hmm. thinking about Lexi, myself. You know what I mean? Like if we all could like chat and maybe say, hey, were you treated this way? Did this happen to you? No one's gonna believe us. The audience hates us, but you know what? The the audience is predominantly a certain demographic, so that's to be expected. But the point is, everyone getting to me, getting um, 
their own justice, whatever that their personal justice, their vindication, their, okay, I can walk away. I can like move forward because it's a really tough place to be. Like really it's not, not easy. Yeah. I feel for you. And I'm happy that, you know, you have this moment to say what you have to say. You know, I think yeah. there's power in that. And I think we're going to see more stories come out, especially since Bravo said these NDA NDAs are lifted and, you know, cast members can speak out uh, with the purpose of speaking up against, you know, workplace uh, issues. What did you think when that came out? I felt a huge sense of relief because... There is a lot of intimidation tactics used, um, our contracts. Um, they also love to do this, the promise of, if you be good and you keep your mouth shut, we might put you on another season, but they never mm -hmm. do. They string you along. They basically are like, if you behave and you, and you say what we want you to say, then we might put you on another season and you can redeem yourself. You can have a redemption season or we could like when they know damn well, they're not going to do that. And they leave you living in limbo. Like, am I ever going to get my chance again yeah. to like rectify my image when in reality, probably not. And it's not coming like for, for like, I think myself, I can't speak for all the other people, but like that was something that was kind of promised to me, but deep down knowing that that's bullshit, it's not happening. Um, and it was really hard to like let that go and just accept it. And when I finally did, forgot about it, moved on, doing my own thing, all of this happens where I'm just like, okay, the NDAs I'm not bound to anymore. So who do I need to talk to then? Yeah. You know, because yeah, discrimination, the racism, the covering up of things is true. It's true. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I mean, listen, and then, of course, on um, August 24th, last, I think, a week ago, um, there was another Rolling Stone article where they broke the news that a member of production on season four of Below Deck Sailing Yacht accused your former cast member, Gary King, of sexual misconduct and believed that it was being covered up. The article went into detail about uh, what happened, what Samantha Suarez uh, experienced, allegedly. And uh, she also said something that you have mentioned that other former cast members and current cast members on shows on Bravo have um, insinuated the amount of alcohol that is given and there is no food provided. I, I want to ask you, what does that look like? Because from what we see, we see you guys go out to dinner. We see you go out to a bar. We see you order drinks. And so we don't really get to see the situation in which production is given alcohol. And do you have the option to say no? And if you do, what happens? Can you set that up, what that looks like for us? Yeah. So um, obviously for us, we can't drink on charter. We can't, you know, maritime law, that's just dangerous in general. So, and everyone, we're really good about that. And plus you're too busy. You don't care. You don't want to drink during charter. Um, but the charters are only two or three days. Uh, we drop off the guests and we we tidy the boat. We finish working around five and then we you know, shower, eat, you know, we always have food on the boat. There are, you can make yourself leftovers, a cup of noodles. We see that a lot this season. And I wouldn't be surprised if the producers are urging the cast to eat mm -hmm. because of all of this stuff, right? Um, So we go out and then we don't get our food, especially if you're in Europe, we don't get our food until, so, okay, sorry. We flip the boat, we get off. We get dressed, we pregame, right? Mm -hmm. We go off the boat around, you know, 7.30, 8 o'clock. We go to the destination, um, the restaurant, and we're not, we're, we start drinking again. So by the time the food hits the table, 
it's pretty late in the evening and we're already sauced. We're mm -hmm. already, we're already drunk by the time the food gets there. Most of us, right? Because um, in Spain and, you know, in Europe, we eat late, they eat late, you know? So it's normal to have dinner at 11. But um, yeah, by the time dinner hits the table, you're drunk and then you continue drinking. Then you go back to the boat and drink some more and da 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 um what i'm not saying it's encouraged like on our nights out like from production where like it's not obviously encouraged but it's kind of what it, what's expected but you mm -hmm. know kelsey she was sick the first like two weeks she was not feeling well and she didn't she barely drank and no one said anything to her but I know that she had trouble with production in terms of they were saying that she was boring and that she wasn't engaging enough and the, and she felt a lot of pressure and she was really sad because she's like this is just who I am I'm chill like I don't drink like that like yeah. that's not me I'm just being myself and plus I don't feel well and um so I in her one-on-one -on -one interviews they would make her feel really bad like mm -hmm. You seem like you don't want to be here. You know how many people want to take your place and, you know, stuff wow. like that. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Um, and then there was maybe like after the first, after the two, first two nights out for me, I was already seeing the vibe was off. I was like, these people don't get my humor. These people don't like me. I'm not vibing. I'm just not going to drink like when we go out anymore. This was in the very beginning, like the first week and a half. And um, one night I was like, you know, I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna drink. And I think I said it to one of my, my castmates. I don't know if it was Ashley or whatever. I was like, I'm just not gonna drink tonight. I'm not really feeling it. And I was behind the bar grabbing myself like a Perrier on the boat and a producer came up to me and she was like, hey, I know that you're a little like embarrassed about what happened the last time you guys went out and like you're feeling a little nervous about drinking and you don't want to drink but just forget about it everybody gets drunk everybody gets blacked out like like don't let one mistake like hinder your fun mm. like have a drink just take it easy like really you broke the fourth wall to come tell me to drink when i because you heard me say like I'm not drinking tonight because I don't fuck with these people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, like it's it's a it's a weird situation to be in. Plus, we're with a bunch of strangers, people we don't know. So it seems like you know if you have social anxiety, like and that's just what you go to. You know what I mean? And um, it is discouraged to not drink. And then so we go out, we come back, we we drink till three or four in the morning. Then we have to get up the next morning and go to our interviews. Yeah. Okay. So you get to your interviews, still a little feeling a little saucy. Yeah. And they have craft services and it's potato chips, peanuts, water. And then, um, which is surely not water, enough to recover pizza, from vodka, champagne, wine. Oh, wow. Food. Yeah. Wow. And, I don't know. I was a bartender for 10 years before I started yachting. Hair of the dog is how I survived my whole bartending career, right? So you wake up feeling a little hungover slash kind of still tipsy. You go to your interview first thing in the morning and um, you're like, I need hair of the dog to like, all right, let's to straighten out. You know what I mean? Yeah. And like some of the questions are so repetitive sometimes they're saying things that put like that you didn't even know happened that are being put into your head like she said what about me yeah oh, when did that happen so now you're like oh thinking everything and now you're like oh, i i need a shot like this is a lot and i feel like in those situations because i think a couple producers saw how i would get when i would reach my limit that my producer personally that was interviewing me she was always assigned to me. She was looking out for me. She was looking out for me. And That's I think the, like, one of the EPs was like, hey, don't let Gabby drink today. Like, make sure Gabby doesn't get too drunk today, you know, during her interview. And I felt like a child and being like I was being babysat, but it was necessary. Yeah. 
Because also, because if you get too drunk during your interviews, they can't use that footage and it's a whole waste of a day. That's you know fine. what I mean? But, um, or there, I remember an instance where the a whole interview was thrown out because I was crying the entire interview. Because I was emotional from stuff that was going on on the boat. There were heavy topics that we were talking about during the interview and I was drunk. They couldn't, they didn't use any of that footage and it was just a whole waste. So, so it's a, we're all adults. So like how, as a producer, are you supposed to decide like they've had enough? You know, I think it's, it's a really difficult position for them to be in because they want to make good TV. Um, so drawing the line and finding, you know, what is ethical and what isn't. And then after you, your interview, when you get back to the boat, which is like six hours later on your day off, mm -hmm. not really a day off, they have um, like food delivered to the boat and then you eat, you know? So it's, I lost like seven pounds in the four weeks I was there. Wow. I, um, I want to say it's just because I was so busy. Like I was working my ass off. So when I when I watch the show back and I see how many shots and clips there are of Ashley or Daisy or Gary eating in the crew mess, it boiled my blood because I never got to sit down really and like eat a full meal. Like and on my my breaks, I was so tired I would go straight to my cabin and go to bed. That's my fault, but I'm just saying like the stress, the like the crappy food they brought us on our days off on the weekend at like during our interview days and just being so hung over all the time like i i lost weight i was so i was unhealthy just in general mentally spiritually and physically yeah i mean you know i'm i'm happy that you explained all of this because like i'm someone that loves the production aspect of television and I always know that what we see is not always what has happened or the full story so I appreciate you explaining to us um what happened what happens because it's not you know yes you are an adult and you have agency over those decisions but there are also varying factors that go into making this show and it's the unspoken pressure of drinking it is uh you know production massaging you to feel more comfortable with drinking so they can get something worth filming so it can end up on the show so there's multiple factors that go into kind of what is being alleged to be an unsafe work environment for yeah. uh cast members absolutely and but i do want to acknowledge that Although, you know, my time on the show wasn't very conducive to my my health or my career, um, I did have some crew members looking out for me. Mm -hmm. That they were invisible to me because we couldn't talk to them and they were wearing masks because it was during COVID. And like, you know, there would be days when a cameraman knew I was down because they can hear what we're saying and they encourage us to speak to ourselves like under our breath to add context to the scene. And they could always hear me like t griping or talking or whatever. And, you know, I have a cameraman walk by and like squeeze my shoulder like you're you're going to be OK. Mm, um, that's my wonderful. producer that did my interviews, I feel like, you know, sometimes when we had a really heavy interview session and I was crying a lot you know, at the end, I would turn off my mic pack and we would sit outside and smoke a cigarette and she would cry with me, mm. you know? And like, I had people on the camera crew, I'm not naming names, tell me that on the nights I was having a really bad blackout or drinking night that they would purposely not film me. Oh. And focus on other people until I went down to bed. Like, like, I didn't want, I didn't want to make, I didn't want to see you like that. So I didn't, I would just be like, oh, look, what's going on over here? You know? And like, I really obviously didn't find any of this out until a lot later about the little people, the little, the little people, <laughs> the, little okay. people the, the little bits of people that yeah. were advocating for me behind the scenes that I did not know. 
you know, like the what the production crew member that wrote the blind item. Mm. Because allegedly, like an article after the blind item came out said that it was rented, written by a production insider. And then I got a DM from a cast member saying that her friend worked on the show with me and immediately called her and told her what they were doing to me. That was her words. Mm. So she reached out to me like, hey, girl, are you OK? I have a friend that worked on your season and she told me what they did to you. Are you good? And I'm like, no, I'm not good. <laughs> but thank you for telling me. So like there were people in production that were like standing by watching like this doesn't seem right. This doesn't seem OK. And that in their own way, as much as they possibly could, were advocating for me that I didn't know of you know, until later yeah. to become friends with them after filming or so on and so forth. So, yeah. It, it's, it's interesting um, because it's, you know, I, I saw that you, you did an interview with an online magazine in reaction to what happened on this season of Below Deck Down Under mm -hmm. with Margot and that vile human being, uh, Luke. And, you know, the juxtaposition from what we saw and how we saw that handled versus what was alleged in that Rolling Stone article about your former cast member, because I believe a crew member that did not want to be named said that uh, this cast member has been witness to be inappropriate with women on several occasions in front of producer producers. And it was filmed but cut out but here on below deck down under we saw a lot and do you do you think that well do you think it has to do with the production the differences between the production company for below deck down under and probably uh below deck sailing yacht i do yeah okay um i do um because you know i I was being interviewed to go on Below Deck for over a year before I went on the show. So I developed a relationship with my casting directors. And when I spoke to one of my casting directors in length, in tears about my experience, he was genuinely, genuinely flabbergasted and sad for me. I'm so sorry. I didn't know any of this. And I feel like it's my fault. Like I, I, threw you to the wolves and I had no idea that it was going to go that way. Um, so I don't want to blame the entire production company, mm -hmm. you know, because there are people like the camera crew, the sound people, the makeup artists. That was my therapist, my makeup artist, Diana. She was my therapist <laughs> pretty much. And like, you know, the people that didn't film me when I was at my worst and like those people I don't want to tie them in with yeah. the whole of the production company but I want to say that it really lies on the shoulders of the higher executives mm -hmm. and producers for the production company um but the thing is is that there are favorites there's favoritism um there's subconscious bias there and I mean, if you've been filming a show for four or five, six seasons, you become actual homies with these producers mm. and you hang out outside of the set. You hang out in other countries. You hang out in L.A. when you go when you fly back and forth for your interviews. And we're all the same age. Like, you know, like some of us are I would say everyone's between 35 and 45. Yeah, your peers. Cast. There are peers. We're co-workers at this point. Whether you're the on-camera talent or the, a producer, we're colleagues, mm -hmm. right? So sometimes if that's your homie and, you, and you're the boss, just like in any corporate environment, just like in any other job, you might, you might let some shit get a, slide and, and personally- get a pass. I, you get a pass on it. Personally, I think that there's like an alliance between a certain group of crew members and production um, where they all look out for each other. 
and they all make sure each other is getting their bag and they will ice out anyone that gets in their way. And that's basically what happened to me. Mm. So, wow. I mean, there should be a reality show about the production crew filming below deck because I'm sure that they're what they deal with. Cause they're also um, living on location, drinking mm -hmm. together, working together 24 seven. I'm sure that they have the exact same amount of drama as we do on the yacht. Because like I said, we're all the same age, we're all colleagues and we're all, we're all living and working together. So, I mean, where do you draw the line? It's just such a gray area. It's so murky that it's hard to untangle all of the strings and figure out who is to blame. It's a trickle down effect, yeah. you know, it's, it's really complicated. That's why I'm, I'm kind of even scared to dip my toes in the pond to see, you know, like what's going to happen. Like, I really just want to finally say my, my piece and speak my story because I was holding it in for so long and it was eating me alive. And I finally got over that hump and then this happened. So I'm just like, Oh God, do I want to re-traumatize myself and get involved and be an advocate if I can help someone else that'd be great but like I don't know like I'm at a good place in my life and I don't know if I want to yeah. fight this beast it's a yeah. huge company it's so it's intimidating you know what I mean and there's so many of us that have been mistreated it's like I mean there is strength in numbers but at the same time it's like like is anyone gonna care well, you just, you want to maintain your peace. I do. You know? I do. Especially after you've been trying to regain it back since being on the show. And so yeah. to speak I worked out, really hard for it. I worked yeah. really, really hard for it. And um, I was in a really, really dark place after the show. I was broken. Broken, broken, broken. And, you know, like it has taken me a long time to feel how I feel today and be able to work. Like, you know, I probably took like a month or two off at the end of last year because I was just, to me, I felt like I was unfit for my job mm -hmm. just because of everything. And I was like, it was hard. And here I am almost a year later since I came back to California, like feeling like I did it. Like, I'm good. I already finally let it go. Like I, I could watch the show again without being triggered and feeling mm -hmm. my body get hot and like you my breath my breath changing and like wanting to cry, my throat burning. Like I used to not even be able to see a commercial, you know? Um that's a because lot. Because like, mentally and physically, like it feels like you're right back there. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't know if what my involvement will be um, with the whole uh, reckoning situation, but I, I'm not, I'm not saying that I'm not going to get some information. Like I would like an explanation of what the fuck happened to me, you know, just, and just, you deserve I, that, you know, just, I would need an explanation and a, and a sorry, you know what I mean? So We'll see. It just seems like there has to be at least basic guidelines of standards and practices from the top down of how certain things should be handled. Um, and it seems like that might be what is lacking. Um, yeah, but like we go through the same training as you would go to through on any in any job where you have your like sexual harassment training day mm -hmm. and your discrimination day where they talk about like what comments are not, you know? Yeah. They, they do sit us down in the beginning, excuse me, when we first get there and they have a lawyer come in and give us this briefing about proper workplace conduct, you know? But it's their lawyer. So who is he there to protect anyway? You know what I mean? Them, not you. It's just them saying, we can say that we did this. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Um, so there definitely needs to be a change. And and I, I think I made a tweet about this. I said, it's not that I want to see Bravo burn. I I love Bravo. I've been watching it since a child, okay? I love, mm -hmm. I love the shows. I love all of them. I just want to prevent any 
people that go on the shows to be have fair treatment, especially the women of color that go on these shows where they're outnumbered mm -hmm. some of the time. Like, I just want everyone to be treated well and fairly and not, ugh, not ganged up on by yeah. production when you're already the only black person in the room. Like that's just, I just want things to change. Not necessarily for me, like my time is done. I did it, been there, done that. Yeah. But like for whoever wants to go on the show after me, that there are advocates, like there's advocates in place to, you know, check everyone. I mean, if someone says something racist to me, I shouldn't be the one getting a talking to because I popped off. But if there was one, at least one black producer to be like, hey, 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 hold up, hold up. No, we're not doing that. And hey, are you okay? You know what I mean? That would have yeah. made a huge difference for me. <clears throat> you know? Yeah. That's all. That's all I'm no. at. That's all I want. I mean, I just... it so much reminds me of uh, Ebony K. Williams. Uh, who was on <laughs> season? I love her. She I, she was on she was on something else, but like I was like, wow, I wish I could articulate myself that way. <laughs> it, it was like the way. I mean, she really had those ladies on their toes right. last season. Yeah. It was so and, funny, and, and I loved uh, every minute. <laughs> yes, I enjoyed it too. I was like, oh, they have never dealt with anything like this before. But no. on on her podcast she went into details into like the several instances of um i guess hr investigations into the things that allegedly ramona said that we did not get to see that were racially involved wow. um and uh, you know ebony mentioned that you know after joining the show Bravo did, or the production company did make sure that there were more people of color working, uh, producers as well. And I was just like, I was surprised because I'm from New York. I'm from Long Island, but it's just like, New York City is like the most diverse city, not only yeah. in this country, but in the world. Yeah. And so the fact that the show did not have diversity in the background of production mm -hmm. yeah. and who we saw on the camera and their That's stories wild. being told until possible? 13 years in yeah i was like this is insane no that's true that's true and it's oh man i just i've been watching reality tv since i was a kid and i think i always knew innate innately that it's not for us yeah it's, it never works out well. I watched, I grew up watching Survivor. And, you know, there was a couple of times where, you know, the black girl won twice, the Puerto Rican chick won twice. Uh, but that was way later. You know what I yeah. mean? Like, I think watching these shows growing up, I was like, okay, reality TV is not for, for black folks. It's not, like, it's just not. That's what I grew up thinking. So whenever we move forward and the Real Housewives of Atlanta and Potomac come out, I'm like, oh things are changing mm -hmm. and you know I would always get excited when I saw a black girl on below deck because that was my favorite show for a while but then I would always end up feeling icky when I would see that the way that they were treated or spoken to yeah. and never sat right with me and, and constantly and having to have the same conversation about <laughs> what should and shouldn't be said and microaggressions and things like that yeah. I'm like yeah. damn can they come on the show and just like live live, live. Yeah. thank you yeah <laughs> and exist. And like, i will say that like um so my season was filming right after below deck og season mm -hmm. nine with wes and reyna yeah and Ooh. i was in i was in saint thomas around the time it was airing and i was able to watch it and i remember having a full-blown panic attack like nervous breakdown after seeing a few of those episodes uh, where it got really bad because my show had already wrapped. So theirs was airing, but I had already left. And I was just thinking, 
Is that what they're going to do to me? Mm. And I was also being like triggered by some of the shit I dealt with when I was filming. And I was like mentally falling apart. Like I'm going to be another example or another statistic on the show. I'm like, how? I'm like, but then I'll be like, no, they're not going to do me like that because they can't have a third season in a row with the same shit. So maybe I'll get lucky, but that's not right either. You know what yeah. I mean? And I'm like, I, that leading up to our show airing, I was in a constant state of panic and anxiety thinking about what's going to happen. Plus I didn't know what happened half the time. Cause literally no one would tell me, no one, no one hesitated to tell me how horrible I am, <laughs> including some of the production, oh my gosh. but no one ever like told me what was said, who said yeah. what, what happened. And no one, no one made me feel better about it, but they were so quick to lecture me or call me out on some stuff when no one else seemed to be held to the same standard as me yeah. or being pulled aside and spoken to as much. Like it was definitely that feeling of being singled out. So I just wanted it to be different and not because of my light skin privilege. I just thought they were going to make things right. Yeah. You know what I mean? So now yeah. when I get um, other yachties of color saying, hey, like I've been, I've been hit up by, you know, 51 Minds or Shed about being on the show. What do you think? I'm like, mm. I'm just really honest. I just lay it all out. Yeah. And I say the choice is yours, but, you know, be careful. Don't, yeah. don't get drunk. Trust nobody. Like the only person i know that had a decent experience is to me mm, to me he's from south africa but yeah. and her, her and i were friends before either of us got casted on the show she had a completely different experience than i did and it just hurts me because i was actually supposed to be on that season mm. and i would have been with my friend not knowing that we both got got casted um but it didn't work out because I was locked into a different contract with a different production company for a different show. But that didn't work out, by the way. Um, so I would have worked with Nadine from Shed Media. Mm. And I know Nadine and Toomey are really close. And Nadine was supportive to Toomey from what I've been told. And I'm just like, oh. Oh, I wish I had that experience and I wish I got to work with you. Like yeah. that would have been history. The first time ever you have two black stewardesses on the same season. Like that would have been, and we already had a relationship before. So that would have been yeah. so different. You know what I mean? And, but you know, I guess everything happens as it's supposed to. Um, so maybe there's a reason I had the experience I had. I don't drink anymore. Mm. So that's good. A lot good of people. For you. Are, a lot of people that go on the show end up going sober. <laughs> like, I've spoken to at least five ex cast members that reached out, like, "Are you good? <laughs> do you need like, do you need any support?" Yeah. And like, I've been sober curious for years, even before the show. But like, I am like, oh, I'm just. It's not my friend. Mm. Alcohol is not my friend. Um, and I want to be the best person that I, I can be. And I want people to see the real me and alcohol tends to muddy those waters for me. And like, um, I just got tired of it, but like, you know, that's a good thing that has come out of it. Um, I've spoken to many, many women of color and men around the world that want to get into yachting because they saw me on the show. They asked for advice. Where do I start? What do I do? And like, that makes me feel good. Cause that was the whole yeah. point. That was the whole reason yeah. I did it to begin with, because our industry is not very diverse to begin with. Very and true. So I think I, I served my my purpose, like my purpose for going on the show. No, I'm not invited to BravoCon every year. No, I'm not getting um, brand endorsements and deals from like Jameson or, you know, whatever random companies. Yeah. But there's like a deeper understanding that I have about the network and the demographic of our audience. And I understand why those opportunities are not afforded to me. 
if you if you know you know if you're watching mm -hmm. this you can read between the lines you know what i'm saying so i've been able to just accept that and i know in time i will end up in the right place and the right people that will you know give me my happy yeah. ending if you will have my happily ever after um but i guess below mm -hmm. deck sailing yacht and bravo wasn't wasn't my ticket you know what i mean and that's okay like that's okay i mean i have to say you know i know you mentioned that you're still kind of healing from your experience mm -hmm. uh on the show and um working there but I have to say you should be extremely proud of yourself because your ability to s speak on it and say the thing um, and be able to provide insight to all of us who have no idea what this world is like. We just see we we just see the 42 minutes each episode and, and that's it. And we base our judgment off of that. We have no clue what happens when yeah. you're on the and, show and also it's it's not just it's not just about production people don't understand the yachting industry whatsoever that's why they're watching the show it's an escapist show yes. when i was watching it i was in hospitality so that's why i loved vanderpump rules but below deck was what hooked me because i was like living vicariously through them because that was a job i could never imagine i didn't even know it was a job that you could do and i'm like yo i'm gonna do that one day and so i get it but people don't understand the yachting industry i'm gonna be real with you right now and just say that for the caucasian people that go on the show their behavior is usually inconsequential when they come back to yachting usually and for those of us that are not in that group we can't we have more to lose okay like we can't go on that show and act a fool because the we're not going to just be able to move on with our lives and yeah. it's fine like i'm just i don't think people understand that um how the pressure that surrounds that and um trying to break stereotypes um while like actively trying to not prove any stereotypes to be true yeah. while combating microaggressions and you know sub like subconscious bias from your cast members like it's it's a whole different ball game for us and i and it's like that in the in the actual yachting industry as well and i don't think that's what people get like i just feel like you're like we're always being written off like well, if you weren't such a bitch, then, you know, people would have liked you. It's like, it's not that easy because it's even deeper if, than that. if I speak up for myself, I have an attitude. Yeah. I'm constantly being villainized. If I tell someone like it is, then I'm a bitch. It's like, how are we still in this place where people cannot see that? But I will say my season, I got so many people of every race and culture saying hey i saw that as much as as my story and my life as they edited out of the show which they did they didn't show my backstory they didn't show my my family history like they always do with everyone else yeah they didn't show anything they didn't show all the time i spent with the guests or not they edited me out of that show they wanted to get me off that screen as soon as possible and uh, like you know, I was there for seven charters and I got 10 episodes. Scarlett was there for two charters and got six episodes. Like, how? Mm. Anyways, it's like, you know, people just were like, we saw that. So I was like, okay. So even though they, they try to put me on screen as least as possible, people were still able to see those things. And that was really heartwarming for me and validating like okay i'm not crazy because uh, you know when you do have a complaint or point something out like that someone always says oh you have a victim mentality why are you always the victim it's like that is also so dismissive and another way to invalidate your experience and i was getting a lot of that but the majority was like some of some people were saying stuff that i didn't even notice or i was like oh shit you're right they did say that that that's fucked up yeah you know? 
when I was finally able to watch the show, like in its entirety, I was just like, wow. <laughs> you know? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, you know, Bravo fans, they are, they are on it. On it. They notice everything. We'll everything. rewind, pause, take a mm -hmm. screenshot. And <laughs> like, record. <laughs> yes, yes. And, it, it, you know, like one of my friends that, that I'm in a group text with, uh, she sent me something uh, that she discovered on this season of Below Deck Down Under. And I'm like, I watched that episode two times and I did not see that. <laughs> I love Bravo fans. I swear they all should be in the CIA. <laughs> yes, yes. You can't they, nothing past us. They will find out. We will find out and we will let it be known. We will yeah. let it be known. Yeah, no, for real. Oh for my real. Gosh. It's almost kind of scary, but it's it's also funny like there's just so many clever people out here that that watch the show where they're like wait a minute and i love that about bravo fans but like sometimes i'm like <laughs> you know because like like i said like i'm not drinking but like sobriety isn't a straight line so yeah. when i publicly say like oh i don't drink anymore i'm afraid that one day yes i'm gonna fall off the wagon because i have many times Someone's gonna be like, ha. Ah. Yes. You and know? post it someplace. <laughs> and be like, she lied. <laughs> yeah. She's a full blown alcoholic. <laughs> she lied. It's like on so July 7th, she said she was sober for two months, but this was taken on July 6th. Like, ah. <laughs> oh man. No, oh, but I'm there's gone. some stuff where I was reading, like, oh, like, um, Cause like we watch the episodes before they air, but like we watch them so spread out. And like, um, when I finally saw the show, like episode, like binged it, I guess you could say mm -hmm. now I was like, Oh no, I see what everybody was talking about because everyone was saying that the whole me and Marcos thing didn't make sense. And how'd I go from one day being fine to, Hey, I'm quitting. Yeah. And I'm like, cause I agree with that. Yeah. They, they were like, it doesn't make sense. It came out of nowhere. And to me, I'm like, it didn't come out of nowhere. It was a buildup that just no one saw. You know what I mean? Mm. Um, but like when I watched it, I was like, oh, that was out of left field. But then I remembered how badly they wanted me off the show and how they rushed me off and how they edited cut. Like we had a three day charter that I, I was with the guests the entire time. We went wine tasting, went to like um, a vineyard. We had, I was, I did relay races with them in the water that three-day charter was turned into one day and they didn't mm. show all the time and the relationship that I had built with these people because I was with them the most you know what I mean so they were like we need to get Gabby out of here how can we edit this so yes they skipped a bunch with the Marcos and I build up um so now when, when I finally saw it I was like oh no wonder why the everyone was like what happened that makes no sense that makes no sense and i i was like yes it does it makes perfect sense he's a dick and i call him on his shit you know <laughs> what what's confusing but then when i saw it i was like oh yeah editing kind of dropped the ball on that one like it does not make sense is but there anyone that any one of your former cast members that you were in contact with at all or have heard from since being on the show um, I lightly talk to Tom still. Okay. Um, we were talking heavy in the beginning, um, after I left because we were both in Europe and he was really, really struggling with the show, like how he was going to be portrayed, how he got fired from his boat because they found out he was on it and he mm. was down bad. He was down and out. And like, I was always like a little big, like a big sister to him. So me and Tom talked a lot after filming and we even hung out in in Palma when we were both there when he got another job um but then it kind of fizzled out because you know he went back to his regular life and so did I and oh he's like 10 years younger than me like what are we going to talk about <laughs> <laughs> a child you know what I, I mean? understand that yeah um Kelsey and I were really we're both from San Diego uh we hung out once and we were talking quite regularly but then she's 
I saw that she started hanging out with Ashley a lot, like traveling mm. with her. They were celebrating each other's birthdays. And I kind of just, I was like, oh, I'm, I'm good. So like, we're still cool, but we don't talk. I, the, the, there's people from other franchises that I talk to all the time. And I would consider really close friends of mine, but no one from my season. I recently just got into it with Daisy via text. Oh. Because I, before I was even on the show, I was a commentator, okay? I would I would talk about the show all the time. So I don't know why I can't talk about it now just because I was on it. I think um, I was commenting on the love triangle thing and she attacked me in the comment section on like a TikTok post, which I it was weird because she oh. never used to respond to any yeah. like trolls, haters, articles, nothing. So the fact that she responded directly to me and chewed me out in the comment section and said some really mean things. I was like, I'm like, who are you talking to? So yeah. I just texted her. You know, we, wow. we went back and forth. We're not friends. I'm not friends with any of them. I don't like them. I don't want to be friends with any of them. So like my friends are Nathan and Casey and um Adrian Gang from season one. Like those are my below deck homies and everyone else were acquaintances. Like I love Matt, Matt, um, Madison, Lucy, but we're not friends, but like I talk yeah. to people, I still talk to people, Yeah. but my friends, friends that I kick it with, that I would work with are from other franchises to me, love her. So I found my tribe within the below deck community, I guess you could say, but it does feel a lot like high school. You're in the main click or you're not. You know, I didn't fit in in high school and I'm not going to fit in now. That's just, mm. <laughs> I'm, I don't belong in a clique and that's fine with me. You know what I mean? Well, because you're a leader and not a follower. Period. Period. Dot. <laughs> <laughs> Period. Dot. <laughs> oh oh my gosh. Gabby. Can I call you Gabby or Gabriella? Yeah. No, okay. Me, Gabby. I want to thank you so much for coming on my show like this was such an eye-opening conversation and I want to make clear that I am not trying to throw Bravo under the bus Bravo NBC Universal um it's just my belief that these stories should be shared so that things could be done differently to create a better environment for every one involved that's yes. simply it that's exactly my thing too. I'm not like, I, I want to see them burn and I want revenge. No. no, 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 no. I just want fair pay for people and advocacy in place so everyone can feel included, a more inclusive environment yeah. and a more fair environment. That's all I'm saying. And if something can be done through all of this, so p future cast members don't develop addictions after they film don't get you know end up in mental health facilities don't turn to drugs don't you know ruin their own lives because they're so traumatized from their experience on the show which i've heard these stories i didn't just mm -hmm. pull these out of the air and i damn near was there myself well it, and it's also been alleged as well so right. you know you're right. not pulling them out of thin air right no no and and i just I just want it to be a better environment. I'm not, yeah. I'm not like going on a witch hunt, yeah. you know? Um, so I, I appreciate the opportunity to share yeah. a little bit of insight into yeah. like what happens. Um, now that the NDA is not hanging over my head, I hope to not receive a call about this interview. <laughs> Same. <laughs> um, but I, thank you so much for your time and for reaching out. It was so nice to meet you. Yes, um, it, it was a pleasure. I, I greatly appreciate it. And um, uh, and also before you go, mm -hmm. where can everyone find you? Where can everyone follow you? How can people support you? Okay, so I'm on Instagram at underscore little Gabby, little proper, not like Lil Wayne. <laughs> at Gabby with Gabby with one B. Um, I'm on. Twitter at Sailing Gabriella with one L and TikTok underscore little Gabby as well. Um, and Cameo underscore little Gabby. So okay. if you want to send me some money for a video, 
Hit me up on Cameo. <laughs> Send her those dollars. Give me the bill. Give me the bill. <laughs> uh, again, I thank you so much. And you are always welcome on the show to share your story. If you want to ever recap anything, you're more than welcome. Um, you, you know, this floor is yours. Um, I hope yep. you have a wonderful weekend. And I thank you again. Thank you Give so it up for Gabby, everyone. Bravo, Even though it's just me. Bravo. <laughs> <laughs> oh right, my God. Take Bye. care. Bye. Bye.